Morning. It's time for Matthew 11. That's a message popped up. All right. Matthew 11. And it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples. In the previous chapter, he had given a whole bunch of commandments. Matthew took... Uh, uh, Matthew's not a... A linear book and that it's not progressing through time he, he kind of categorizes things and he had categorized a lot of the commandments to his disciples in, in the uh, 10th chapter so this is winding up the 10th chapter by saying and it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of the commanding his 12 disciples he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities now uh, some people believe that their cities means the cities that they are from. I believe it was the cities that they went to. Um, it just makes sense that he's not picking cities. So well, I think I'll just go to my, you know, my buddies, my disciples, towns, and and teach. Now, when John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent to a, two of his disciples and said unto him, "Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another?" And let's see, I got a note in there. Okay, Jesus, John, John was had uh, been in prison. He uh, uh, he had been thrown in prison. He had been in prison for a while, and he was expecting the kingdom to come to almost immediately, because that's the way prophecy looks. If you if you look at the prophecies about the kingdom, you'll see uh, a description of what the kingdom coming would be like. And a lot of times it stops short. Uh, we'll see that in a minute. Uh, so he's a, he was expecting it to come immediately. It wasn't coming. He was in prison, and Jesus came to set the prisoner free. So he's he sitting there going, "What's going on? I, I'm this is just my imagination. Now you you have to evaluate it whether you think it's true or not. But in my opinion, the way he was, he was in prison, he was supposed to be the guy running ahead of the king, saying, "Here comes the king." smooth out the road and here he is in jail <laughs> he got put in prison it's like he's been sidelined and it, it's for people who believe that God's will is always done they can be disconcerting to see well, here I am in jail so it must be God's will I'm in jail and if it's God's will I'm in jail and I'm supposed to be the one out there proclaiming then I, you know, he's, I'm just con I'm confused what's going on yeah, he was. It was a lot of self, a lot of pressure to doubt that Jesus was the King that was coming, that he was proclaiming, because he was in prison. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Go, show John again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight. Now, this is these are prophecies, fulfillment of prophecies. The blind receive their sight. And the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. The gospel, God, the gospel means almost too good to be true news. So some very, very, very good news is being preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. Now, if in our culture, offense means being offended just means you got your feelings hurt. It's not what offended means in, in scripture. It means it's more of a, I want to see what my note says here. It says uh, offended means to abandon interest in, to judge unworthy. An example, um, a good example is when Jesus says, unless you drink my blood and eat my body, you can't, you can't be saved. This is in John six fifty three. Uh, Verily, verily, I say unto you. Now, remember, whenever you see verily, verily, I say unto you, he's going to really say something that sounds incredulous, but you, it's truth, so you should believe it. A lot of people take, when they see verily, verily, I say unto you, what they take after it, they interpret it to mean something different because it's just so unbelievable. So, verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso 
eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father hath sent me, and I live by the Father, so that he, so he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Well, what does all that mean? Well, it means that what it said. I, I all I know is if I'm when I'm given the opportunity to eat of Jesus and drink his blood, I'm taking the opportunity. <laughs> I don't know. Other than that, it's it's kind of a mystery to me. But what he said is true. And many, therefore, of his disciples, when they heard this, said, "This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Because Scripture tell said not to drink blood." It's, uh, when, when you, as far as animals concerned, and Jews were very literalist, so he, they're going like he's he's telling us basically to disobey scripture, but uh, it doesn't it doesn't mean that because scripture is always in harmony with each other. I don't know what it means, but it doesn't mean that. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, "This is a hard saying. Who can hear it?" When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Doth this offend you? What and if ye, sh what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before, it is the Spirit that quickeneth, the flesh pro profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are those among there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew the beginning, who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you, that no man can come unto me, except it were given unto him of my father. And I probably read a little bit too far. far, but the, um, And I've just gotten into a discussion with some people on this. This makes it sound like, only those whom the Father gives him can come unto him. And that was true then, but what is true now is different because Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So there's two different things going on. This is before the cross and, and then there's after the cross. That's a little aside, so let's just go back from there. Uh, so offended means to judge superficially and discount is the way I'd interpret it. Blessed is he who should not be offended in me. So if John had gotten offended in Jesus, he said, oh, that's not the one, it's somebody else. That, that would have been John being offended in Jesus. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John. Now he, here, he's, all this stuff happened in front of the other people. And it does. It paints John into in a bad a kind of a bad, bad light because of his con situation, and that it seems that he was doubting that Jesus was was who he who is who who he was expecting. So Jesus is, talks about John and how great John is. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitude concerning John. What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? And I imagine there's got some laughter through this. Because John was definitely not a reed shaken with the wind. But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Now, John was wearing camel's hair clothes and um, eating wild locusts and honey for food. So he's not, this is not just a guy that was dressed in soft raiment. A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before my, thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, hath, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. 
How many people are not born of women? There are some. The angels, angels are not born of women. Uh, here's a good one. Melchizedek. Melchizedek wasn't born of a woman. He said that he has no, uh, fa no father and no mother. Uh, so who, people that are born of women are people that are of the line of Adam. And then the people that are not born of women are, got, are created by God directly, not, not by birth. Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So he that is least in the kingdom of heaven, once the kingdom of heaven comes and we're all in the kingdom of heaven, John will be considered less than us. Even though he's the greatest of the prophets, and of what was the Old Testament has to offer. The new to, what's coming in the new kingdom, in the kingdom of heaven, is so much superior than what was, was up until uh, before the kingdom. Uh, among them that are, not, that are born of women, there hath not risen a, a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist and until the kingdom of heaven, until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. This is a, a much argued over scripture because uh, people don't understand it primarily because uh, from what I understand or what I've learned from listening to other people, is that it has to do with shepherding and how shepherding was done. And what it's talking about there is this talking about the fence, a fence, a paddock that sheep are in. That word violence, suffereth violence, um, means to crowd oneself into. <laughs> it's not just being violent. It was translated violent because they didn't know how to translate it basically, but, but what it's talking about when it's suffering, it's talking about a fence being broken down from pressure. And the idea behind it is sheep in a paddock crowding at a fence trying to get out and part of the fence gets pushed down and the, that's the, the fence suffering the violence or suffering from the pressure of the people being around. And the violent take it by force. Now there's a good example of um, the kingdom of heaven suffering violence with uh, the the woman with the issue of blood that happened in chapter, I think it was chapter nine. Let's, let's go there. Uh, and Jesus arose and followed him and so did his disciples. And behold, a woman which was diseased with an issue of blood 12 years came behind him and touched the hem of his garment. For she said within herself, if I may touch his garment, I shall be whole. But Jesus turned to him about, and when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Jesus. The, the woman had faith that if she touched the hem of Jesus' robe, she would be healed. And when she did, power was drawn from Jesus without his permission and healed her. That was her pushing through the paddock fence. That was the taking the heaven by violence. And when, when that happens, the sheep that... The first sheep goes through, and then all the other sheep follow, of course. And that's exactly what happened here. This woman touched the hem of Jesus' robe, and she got healed. And then, uh, let's see, where's the other verses? We've been over them before. In, in uh, Matthew 14, 35 through 36, which we haven't gotten to yet, this is what happened. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country around about and brought unto him all that were diseased, and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched 
were made perfectly whole. Jesus didn't have to say, be whole, be well. He didn't have to say anything to these people. All these people had to do was touch the hem of his garment. And it was because of the, the hole in the fence that the woman who touched the hem of his garment had made. It's all by faith. And now the days of, uh, and from the days of John the Baptist until now, so it started with John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was to, for to come. He that hath ears, let him hear. So, so he was uh, uh, Elijah. He was the coming of Elijah, the spirit of, it was in his spirit that, that uh, John came. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows. And he's still talking about being offended here. This is flowing. But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets and calling unto their fellows and saying, We have piped unto you, and you have not danced. We have mourned unto you, and you have not lamented. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, He hath a devil. And the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bearer, a friend of publicans and sinners, tax collectors, publicans and sinners. But wisdom is justified of her children. All these people are, are like children. They're being looking at things superficially and judging superficially. And when you judge superficially, you're you're taking offense. You're saying, if you judge Jesus superficially, you take offense at Jesus. You say, this is not who, who we're looking for. Uh, atheists are, take offense really easy. They'll, they, they try to prove that scripture should be, that you should be offended at scripture by showing scripture that they say contradicts each other. For instance, there's a scripture verse that says, forgive so that your father in heaven will forgive you and then there's also a verse that says forgive others because god in heaven has forgiven you so one says forgive to get forgiven if you look at it superficially one says forgive to be forgiven the other one says forgive because you are forgiven and so and they they'll say well it contradicts so you shouldn't look at scripture you should be offended at scripture Um, let's see. Then he began to, I was trying to think if there was anything else I wanted to cover, but I think, well, I do have a note here. Let me check, check this note out. Oh yeah. It kind of reminded me of, uh, uh, I never watched this show, but our, I've heard his audio of, um, oh, shoot, I can't remember the name of the show now. But he says, I am smart. I am smart. S-M-R-T. <laughs> this is, uh, it was, being offended would be kind of like Moses in the desert and seeing a bush burning and dismissing it as something. Like, yeah, this bush burning must have gotten really hot and just kept on walking. That would have been offended at, being offended at the bush. Or for modern day, it would be looking at sports like curling. If you look at curling, which is you know pushing a rock down ice and trying to play shuffleboard with it, you know you kind of think, what's what's the deal? This not doesn't look all that difficult. Or bowling, or any sport that you've never done yourself, you have a tendency to think, yeah, that's that looks pretty easy. You, you underestimate it. So it's to be quick to judge on something. It's what a, a true definition of what a know-it-all is. A lot of times people would call somebody that knows a lot who's trying to share it a know-it-all, but a, really a know-it-all is one who decides he already knows it all when he doesn't know anything. And so this, that's uh, that's what's going on in that in these verses. They're like children. They're, they're judging really quick. Uh, I should go over what the kids said. They're like, we have piped and you have not danced. So they're saying like, we're in a... We're, the kids start playing music and they go, oh, I'm playing music so everybody should dance. Or I'm sad, so everybody should be sad. So it's, it's kind of like a, a self-centeredness. Okay. 
Then he began to upbraid the cities where most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Here's 20 minutes. We have 10 more. Because they repented not. And they, these were the cities that he had gone into that was mentioned earlier in the chapter. And they didn't receive him. Woe unto the Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. So this, this is letting you know that there's levels of judgment. There's, there's going to be levels of, in hell, basically, is what it's talking about. Levels in judgment, levels... Uh, because he's comparing the, you know, how much information, how much knowledge, how much truth you're exposed to and how much you accept. Because uh, Jesus went to these cities and did miraculous works to prove who he was, and they still said no. They still rejected him. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. A Capernaum was a, a coastal city. It was Jesus's. Um, it was where Jesus's headquarters were. It would have been kind of like him having it in a, in Hawaii. It's. Uh, it was a, a place that that everybody really thought positively of. You know, like you know, like we think of of, of the islands, Hawaii, or or the Bahamas, or. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and the prudent. This is a little bit of sarcasm and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. And I say sarcasm because these guys are wise in their own eyes. They're kind of like the children in the marketplace. They're, they're, they think they know it all <laughs> when they don't. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of people that are like that in, in Christianity too. The, unfortunately, it seems the, the more well-taught somebody is, the ones that go to seminary and look down their noses at the ones that don't go to seminary. So that's where they get the, the, the clergy and the laity from. You got clergy and you got laity. That's not in scripture. There's nothing in scripture about separating people into clergy and laity. But, but if you go to seminary, that's what's ingrained in your brain. It's, or if you're not careful, I'm not saying all people are like that. They have a tendency to think of themselves as the upper class, and then, they, then the, the laity, which means the common man, is a different class. And this is what I believe is the practice of the Nicolaitans. It talks about it in Revelation, where it talks about people being the, Nic the Nicolaitans. The practice of the Nicolaitans was the clergy being over the laity, Nicolaitans. Uh, okay, where are we? Let's go back to the prayer. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and hast revealed them unto babes, the common man, the laity. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight, all things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. And he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. The who's in charge of revealing the Father to everybody but the Son. And the Son saith, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. So he is trying to show all men the Father. Come unto me, all ye that are labor, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. That is good news. That is gospel 
almost too good to be true news that we don't have to labor for our salvation. It's a gift. All we have to do is believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. This is Acts 16, 31. Next time, Matthew 12. You guys have a good day.